Distal femur fractures, supracondylar fractures. The femur is the longest and strongest tubular bone in the human body and one of the principal load-bearing bones in the lower extremity. The femoral shaft can be divided into three parts. The proximal portion, including the femoral head and neck and the intertrochanteric area. The middle portion involving the femoral shaft and the distal portion, including the supracondylar area. The distal femur broadens from the cylindrical shaft to form two curved condyles separated by an intercondylar groove, the medial condyle and the lateral condyle. The distal femur includes both the supracondylar and condylar regions. The supracondylar area of the femur is the distal 10 to 15 centimeters of the femur. I will discuss distal femur fractures in this video. Distal femur fractures include fractures of the supracondylar and intercondylar region of the distal femur and are relatively common injuries. The bone can break straight across, transverse fracture, or into many pieces, comminuted fracture. Sometimes these fractures extend into the knee joint and separate the surface of the bone into a few or many parts. These types of fractures are called intraarticular. Distal femur fractures can be closed, meaning the skin is intact, or can be open. An open fracture is when a bone breaks in such a way that bone fragments stick out through the skin, or a wound penetrates down to the broken bone. Femur fractures are high-energy injuries to the femur that may be associated with life-threatening injuries. Femur fractures can cause extensive hemorrhage. Complications and injuries associated with femur fractures in the adult can be life-threatening and may include internal organ injury, fat embolism, pulmonary embolism, and acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS. These fractures often result from high-energy forces such as motor vehicle collisions or falls from height. In older adults, low-energy falls are the most common cause due to osteoporosis especially in elderly women. Industrial accidents and gunshot wounds account for most other femur fractures. Pathologic distal femur fractures are uncommon but can occur from bone cysts, metastasis or, rarely, secondary to primary bone tumors such as osteogenic sarcoma. A distal femur fracture usually causes immediate, severe pain. The patient will not be able to put weight on the injured leg, and it may look deformed, shorter than the other leg and no longer straight. The clinical diagnosis is usually obvious based upon the mechanism and the presence of pain, swelling, and deformity, including shortening of the thigh. Extensive soft tissue injury and bleeding are common. Because of the high association of femur fractures with other injuries, particularly if high-energy trauma is involved, the patient must be carefully assessed following the basic guidelines of Advanced Trauma Life Support ATLS. Stabilization of the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation takes priority. Once the patient is stabilized, a thorough secondary survey is performed looking for other major injuries. As part of the secondary survey, the pelvic ring and hip should be inspected. Neurovascular injury caused directly by a femoral fracture is rare. Nevertheless, a careful neurovascular assessment of the affected limb should be performed. Distal pulses should be palpated. And sensation and motor function assessed. It is often useful to compare findings to the contralateral limb, assuming it is uninjured. Anterior posterior and lateral plane radiographs of the thigh should be obtained when a fracture is suspected. Careful radiographic examination in at least two planes is necessary to determine the exact site and configuration of the fracture pattern. The hip and ankle should also be examined with radiographs to rule out associated injury. A femoral neck fracture may occur in association with a distal femur fractures and, if overlooked, 
can result in significant morbidity and even mortality. A CT scan can provide the doctor with valuable information about the severity of the fracture. This scan can show whether the fracture enters the joint surface and how many pieces of bone there are. A CT scan will help your doctor decide how to fix the break. The management. Pre-hospital personnel should splint the extremity in the position it was found. Essential initial management at the hospital consists of evaluating the patient for major injuries and treating them as appropriate. Placing an intravenous catheter and providing analgesia. Patients with open fractures receive antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis. For the time between initial emergency care and your surgery, your doctor may place your leg either in a long leg splint or in traction. Skin traction splints can be used for both closed and open fractures. Hare or Thomas traction splints are most commonly used. It keeps the broken pieces of bone together and often helps to relieve pain. The device is attached to the ankle at one end and secured against the pelvis at the other. Traction is applied by pulling the ankle distally while the proximal end braces the pelvis to prevent it from moving, thereby enabling distraction of the femoral fracture fragments. Your doctor may prescribe medications to prevent blood clots, relieve pain and treat any infection that may be present. Non-operative management for these fractures is rarely the treatment course. It is only potentially useful for non-ambulatory, comfort care, or extremely high-risk patients. Non-displaced fractures in a reliable patient that can comply with weight-bearing precautions. And environments that lack modern internal fixation devices or intraoperative fluoroscopy. Conservative treatment involves avoiding stress on the fracture, typically through consistent bed rest with skeletal traction through a proximal tibial pin or a distal femoral pin. Skeletal traction is a pulley system of weights and counterweights that holds the broken pieces of bone together. A fracture brace is usually placed between three and six weeks after injury. Only fractures that are limited to two parts and are stable and well aligned can be treated directly with a brace. It should be applied with the limb in extension, external rotation, and slight valgus. Clinical and radiographic follow-up at 1, 2, and 3 weeks after cast brace application is necessary to prevent unrecognized loss of reduction. The brace is worn until the fracture is healed, which is usually by the end of the fourth month. After some time of conservative healing, the leg can be mobilized with physiotherapy. The risks of non-operative treatment may be significant and potentially severe, including deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, decubitus ulcer, pneumonia, urinary retention, and others. The goal of non-surgical treatment is not anatomic reduction of the fracture fragments but reasonable restoration of overall length and axial alignment. Because of the proximity of the fracture to the knee joint, small degrees of malalignment may have adverse long-term effects on the joint mechanics. No more than 7 degrees of malalignment in the coronal plane should be accepted. Whenever possible, malalignment in the sagittal plane should not exceed 7 to 10 degrees. Limb shortening of 1 to 1.5 cm usually does not compromise the functional result and can be addressed with a shoe lift, if necessary. The goal of operative treatment is a balancing act between anatomic alignment and spare the patient long periods of complete immobility and early functional rehabilitation of the limb so that the surgery is indicated for the large majority of distal femur fractures. We recommend that femoral shaft fractures in polytrauma patients be repaired within 2 to 12 hours of injury, provided the patient is hemodynamically stable. Performing operative fracture repair within the first 24 hours decreases mortality, respiratory complications, multisystem organ failure, and length of hospitalization. 
Early surgical repair may be less important in patients with isolated fractures. In some cases, surgery may be delayed one to three days to develop a treatment plan and to prepare the patient for surgery. Nevertheless, we advocate early repair. In cases where there is severe injury to the muscles, nerves or arteries or there is significant contamination with dirt, rocks or grass from the injury, some patient requires external fixation prior to definitive surgical treatment. External fixation may be used in unstable polytrauma to ensure the patient is physiologically optimized prior to definitive fixation. This is an operation where metal pins are placed into the bone above and below the fracture site into the middle of the femur and tibia through small cuts. The pins are attached to a bar outside the skin to stabilize the fracture and hold the bones in the proper position. After secondary operations to clean the wound or recovery of skin injuries, or if the patient is physiologically optimized, the external fixator can be removed and plates and intramedullary nails or plates and screws can be placed. The internal fixation methods most surgeons use for distal femur fractures include a 95-degree angled blade plate. Although we use it most often for stabilization of non-unions and malunions, when used by an experienced surgeon this device can restore alignment and provide stable internal fixation. A 95-degree dynamic condylar screw DCS. This device is based on the compression screw commonly used in hip fractures. The implant shares many of the features of a compression hip screw, making it familiar to most surgeons and therefore easier to master. Other advantages include its ability to apply interfragmentary compression across the femoral condyles. The use of a 95-degree blade plate or DCS is used less frequently today. Periarticular locked plates have replaced these non-locked implants for most supracondylar fractures, in which screws are inserted that lock into the plate, forming a fixed angle construct. In this procedure, the bone fragments are realigned and held together with screws and plates. Intramedullary Nailing During this procedure, a specially designed metal rod is inserted into the marrow canal of the femur. The rod passes across the fracture to keep it in position. In extreme cases, a fracture may be too complicated and the bone quality too poor to fix. These types of fractures are often treated by removing the fragments and replacing the bone with a knee replacement implant. Fractures near knee implants may be treated with rods or plates, just like other distal femur fractures. In rare cases, the artificial implant must be removed and replaced with a larger implant. This procedure may be necessary if the implant is loose or not supported by surrounding good bone. Recovery after surgery. Your doctor will decide when it is best to begin moving your knee in order to prevent stiffness. Knee motion is started on the first or second postoperative day with physical therapy. If the patient is reticent to move the knee, a continuous passive motion CPM, machine is ordered. If the bone was fractured in many pieces or your bone is weak, it may take longer before the doctor recommends motion activities. Whether the fracture is treated with surgery or not, your doctor will most likely discourage weight-bearing until some healing has occurred. In patients with stable internal fixation, Partial weight-bearing is encouraged with crutches or a walker typically 6 to 8 weeks postoperatively. Whereas in patients with less stable fixation or for an intra-articular injury, progressive weight-bearing is usually delayed until signs of fracture healing appear on the X-rays. Usually around 10 to 12 weeks, physical therapy will help to restore normal muscle strength, joint motion, and flexibility. It can also help you manage your pain after surgery. Your leg veins may develop clots after surgery, your doctor may also give you blood thinners. 
Cutting down or quitting smoking and tight blood sugar control is important for the healing process. Clinical and radiographic examinations are performed at four to six week intervals until the fracture is healed and patients are able to ambulate without discomfort. Athletes may safely return to sports when the femur is completely healed and normal strength and range of motion are regained. It may take one year or more for a full recovery and return to normal daily activities.